Yeah? It's Christmas time. Woo! And it's feeling like it outside. All right. Let's start our announcements. We have a uh, special presentation this morning. It's going to take a few minutes, but we uh, want to go ahead and get our announcements over first. We're excited this week that we'll be celebrating Pete Gregory on the 18th for his birthday, Maxine Taylor on the 18th, uh, Jenna Moorhead on the 19th, Raymond Faulkner on the 20th, Blake Stowers on the 20th, and Mary Breeden on the 24th. And I, and I'm gonna have to start asking this. Are there any other birthdays or anniversaries I'm missing? <laughs> All right, we're good. If I got somebody that can play, there you are. I put you in a new spot, I can't find you now. All right, let's sing happy birthday together. <laughs> that the children and the youth are going to get together at 4 30 for christmas caroling um choir practice today yes, at five o'clock evening service at six and then a reminder i forgot all about it last week and my apologies but today is the day from two to six there's an open house at karen and eric faulkner's and we're looking forward to that seeing some of y'all there uh, exciting time so two to six today open house at the faulkner's we will be doing a candlelight service on Saturday at 8 o'clock uh, on Christmas Eve. Looking forward to that, so hopefully you'll be here. We'll be lighting the final candle, which is called the Christ candle, is the way the Advent progresses. And then the following day, we will have one service on Christmas Day. So all the fun stuff, get your brunches in and your presents open and lay around in your pajamas. And we'll gather together at 2 o'clock. Weather pending. Have y'all been looking at the forecast? It's cold here. <laughs> and it looks like Santa Claus may be bringing some white stuff, maybe. I don't know. We'll see. So we'll keep your ears out for that. But the intention right now is candlelight service Saturday night and uh, 2 o'clock service on Sunday, which ought to be okay. Uh, right after the service, if the folks that are going with me to Israel can meet real quick, I'm, we've got a consolidated package and just give you a little more information and, uh, and just get you all excited, and we'll be all, all ready to go for that. I know there's one lady not here, and then uh, there's potential somebody that's going to have to withdraw. So uh, be in prayer about that. And then uh, our last is our search committee got together and has reviewed all the applications that we received, has done the interviews, and made the decision uh, that Natalie Lewis will be our new custodian. She will begin transitioning with her future sister-in-law on um, Tuesday and then uh, work through their honeymoon uh, in her place and then begin full-time uh, after that. So that's, that is the intention there. All right, so that's what we've done. So before we go into our prayer time, Mr. Mike DeWild has been pestering me to do this for a long time. No, he's a, a wonderful friend and uh, he wants to make a presentation about fire safety, some things that we should consider especially this time of year. I've been doing this for 20 years. My name is Mike DeWild. I've been in the fire service for 35 years. I quit two years ago, but they wouldn't let me. <laughs> I was the captain of the Bland Fire Department. I turned, I stepped down, said, here, y'all do it. Let the next generation do it. And eight people from the fire department moved my house and said, we still want you to go with us. 
we'll help you in the truck and we'll make sure you get back to the firehouse. <laughs> well, <laughs> I couldn't very well turn them down. But fire prevention, there is nothing new in fire prevention. You just need to be reminded of it. Nationwide, 2011 through 2020, 192,000 cooking fires, leading cause of fires. Virginia is the same as this, but 33,000 heating fires, 28,000 careless fires. I don't know what that means, but I guess you start a fire and don't mean to. And 23,000 electrical. In 2022, as of September, I have not updated this, 43 people in Virginia have died in house fires. 2021, 69 people have died in house fires. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb here. Because of the high fuel prices, people are looking for a cheaper way to be, to heat their house. We've had two fires. We had a house fire just up the road a month ago. Somebody gave a lady an electric heater and she had a little flimsy extension cord and plugged it up. The extension cord melted, it, set her house on fire. Be smart with other heat sources. If you need help with electric bill or heating fuel, tell someone at your church. Don't go it alone. If you need help, tell Barry. Check your smoke alarms. Change batteries or replace with a 10-year model. 10 years is the life of a fire smoke alarm. If your smoke alarm is over 10 years, go to Napa, Lowe's, and buy you a new one for $20. They got a 10-year model. Once you put it on the wall, it's good for 10 years. All y'all with children or older people in your house, do a fire drill. Do not depend on the schools to do that. Actually, do a fire. tonight probably would not be a good night to do one, <laughs> but some evening, go push your smoke alarm button and make sure everybody wakes up. You need a meeting place outside your house so you can check that everybody's there. If you smell smoke in the house, get everyone out of the house. Close the door when you leave. Call 911 on your cell phone. There is nothing in your house worth risking your life for. Keepsakes and yourself are your things you cannot replace. You can get by without your keepsakes. You can't get by without yourself. If it's smoky in the house, get on the floor and crawl. There's better air and it's cooler. There should have two ways out of every room. If you're in a smoke-filled room and you're crawling, before you grab the doorknob, put your back of your hand up to it. If it's hot, you'll jerk it away. If you reach and grab the doorknob, your hand will melt to it and you'll be stuck there until you rip it away. <laughs> Now I'm going to tell you something you did not know. More people die in house fires than in all the tornadoes and hurricanes. That is a fact. You hear about tornadoes and hurricanes killing people. You don't hear about house fires unless it happens here in the county or something. You'd hear about it. But nationwide, there's more people get burned up in house fires than all the tornadoes and all the hurricanes. Extension cords are temporary. Use it and put it away. And it's not to be covered and walked on. 
If you're using the extension cord, that's fine. But when you're done using it, put the thing away. Like I said, this house fire just up the road here had a, using an extension cord to run an electric heater and it didn't work very good. A fire will double in size every minute. Once it starts burning, the fire will double in size every minute. It takes me six minutes to get to the firehouse. It takes me two minutes to put my gear on. X number of minutes to get to the fire. How many times has the fire done double? You have lived this long without being burnt, try it a little longer. One half of all fires are preventable. One fourth will burn regardless of what you do. Fires are a natural occurrence, they happen. A fourth of the fires, like I said, will burn regardless of what. And one fourth are arson. Myself and the fire department, we are the first line, if we suspect arson, we will notify the state police arson people and they will come and investigate. That's something we do not need as an arsonist doing stuff, so we try to get them put away. People make bad decisions when the electricity is off. Don't be one of them. We've had a house, it was up here in the old CC camp. Electricity was off. They got a barrel, half of a metal barrel, set it in the living room and built a fire in it to keep warm. Think before you do something. We enjoy being firefighters, but when something bad happens to you, it makes our day bad. I had a state trooper get on me or say something to me about we have a good time in a fire. That's the only way we can deal with it. People are losing everything they have, and if we let emotion get to us, we wouldn't be worth a hoot to do anything. And that's all I have. Anybody have any questions? Just be fire smart. I thank you for your time. I thank Barry. I appreciate the veterans dinner y'all did, the first responders program. And there's no fire department in the county. We are just like everybody else. We can't get anybody to replace somebody when they're gone. Nobody wants to do any, nobody wants to work to get paid, much less volunteer to do stuff. But like I said, just be fire smart. We have no problem coming to your house but we'd rather eat with you than we would put a fire out. I thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, very thank you very much. And we appreciate the volunteers. Well, it's, it's gonna get worse this week. They're calling for zero temperatures the end of the week. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Fire safety. All right. Mike's moving on to Bastion Church of God now to share the same information. Uh, it is his calling to take care of us all. And as he is uh, mentioned there, trying to find somebody to work for money is hard and trying to find volunteers is even harder. So we, uh, we're all aware of that as well. If God places a calling on your heart to help in any kind of way, it'd be a wonderful, wonderful thing. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the beauty of this day, and we even thank you for the cold weather. Father, we thank you for your mercy and grace that has protected us, but 
as we have just been reminded, this precious life is fleeting. We make decisions day by day that could cause us to end our lives. Father, you have declared that life is precious. On this day, we would celebrate with so many of your chosen people that are lighting candles to be the light to the world of your provision. So we are reminded this day that all of our provision comes from you, that you are the giver of all good gifts. So we praise you and we worship you and we thank you. Father, in our hearts, we want to come before you repenting of all that we have done in opposition to you, in your will, in your way, in your desires. Father, forgive us and help us to forgive others in the way that you have forgiven us. Father, we have several that are not in our midst today because of illness and because of finding out about illness. Father, we pray healing upon them, your comfort in the midst of the uncertainties. And Father, we lift up our brothers and sisters. Father, for those whose spirits are downtrodden today, we lift them to you. There are those this day that are living a life in confusion that are missing out on your hope and your glory because they are not in fellowship with brothers and sisters. Father, may we be those brothers and sisters to them as you guide us through your spirit. In the midst of all the calamity, the chaos, the sadness, Father, may we encourage one another. May we grieve with those that grieve and may we rejoice with those that rejoice. Prepare our hearts for this service. We lift our praise as we look expectantly in remembering what you did the first time you sent your son. We look even more expectantly what you will do the second. There is a great mission out there, Father. Those that are lost, you tarry, I believe, Father, in your return because not everyone has heard. May this church join with others who have a desire, a passion, a burning, a grieving in our hearts for the lost. And may our only motives day by day to be the upbuilding of one another, the encouragement of one another, and the bringing of the lost to your kingdom. Prompt our hearts, guide our spirits, direct our steps, Use our hands in the work of your kingdom here on earth. We lay this before you because you were gracious to us in the beginning. And through the cruelty of the cross, the sacrifice of your son and his precious blood that covers us, and the strength of the name that we will proclaim today in scripture and in learning, Jesus Christ our Savior. Amen. Amen. Choir, come lead us in some Christmas singing.
I want to make sure we read our scripture reading from Isaiah chapter 7. So if you don't mind standing one more time with me. Isaiah chapter 7 verse 10 is the Old Testament setup for our sermon today. The passage we'll be looking at about the birth of our Savior. And again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be deep at Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. I will not, be, I will not put the Lord to the test. And he said, Hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary men that you would also weary my God? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and he shall call his name Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the boy knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land whose two kings you dread will be deserted. The Lord will bring upon you and upon your people and upon your father's house such days as have not come since the day that Ephraim departed from Judah, the king of Assyria. May God add blessing to the reading of his word. Today we light the fourth candle of Advent. We'll read our responsive reading together and we will illuminate the room a little bit more. Every year we light candles as we prepare for the coming of Christ. More and more candles, more and more light as we watch and we wait for Jesus who is the light of the world. Receive God's promise of love from Psalm 36. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is, li is like the mighty mountains. Your judgments are like the great deep. You save humans and animals alike, O Lord. You may be seated as we get ready for communion. The elders that will be serving will come forward. Today, as we prepare our hearts and minds for communion together, we're reminded about the light of the Lord that came into this world. And upon his departure, he said, I will never leave you or forsake you. There must come, though, a spirit inside of you to empower. You are the light of the world. He also used the metaphor of salt, that we are the salt to bring flavor, to bring healing to the world. And if the salt has lost its flavor... Brothers and sisters, that is me and you if we forget what the purpose is. The salt is to be cast out and trampled underfoot. As we prepare our hearts, I hope what you heard in Isaiah and we will elaborate on in the sermon. Jesus is the beautiful name that we cling to. We sing the name Emmanuel with excitement, but the reality is when God comes, he separates the wicked and the good. Brothers and sisters, in your hearts and your minds today in preparation, be reminded that communion is a serious time that we recognize. Our Savior, who was born, came to sacrifice himself, to die on our behalf. 
And if we treat that flippantly, then we are destined for a curse. Brothers and sisters, today, beg God to forgive you. Today, as you think about the little baby in the manger, weep at the reality that that child had to die for you and the things that you would do wrong. Today, celebrate again with excitement and joy that he did. And praise God, he did. He gave himself for you, for me, and for everyone. As much as you have been forgiven, forgive. Quit holding on to unforgiveness. Because Emmanuel will come. And it will not be pretty. If you hold on to bitterness and unforgiveness and unjustified self-righteousness, beg the Lord today as we prepare to take this together. out the elements my apologies the uh, children's church may just be dismissed
And on that night, when they had finished eating, he took the bread and he reminded them about the story, the reason for the Passover. And then he brought it forward and said, just like that lamb that had to be slain, the body broken, the blood on the post of the doors, to cover you from the death angel. This is my body broken for you. My body sacrificed for you. A body that lived on this earth for 33 years. The excitement of a mother and a father and that same mother standing at the foot of a cross weeping, broken for you. And after he had blessed it, Father, we thank you for the sacrifice represented in the coming of your Son that we celebrate. Father, as we celebrate the birth of Jesus, it is the beginning of the season in the church that we look toward the cross and the victory through the sacrifice. We thank you for the broken body and what it means to us that our bodies can be restored. We thank you for the sacrifice of your son's physicalness so that our eternity could be secured. So because of that, Father, we take again today in remembrance of you until you come again. Come, Lord, quickly. Amen. Take each of you and eat. And in the same manner, he took the cup, the cup of Elijah, the expectation of the announcement that the Messiah would come. He had declared already that John was Elijah, that Elijah had come, that that part of the Passover feast had been completed. And so now, because of Elijah's return, they would drink the cup in a different way. The blood over the, la- over the door frame, the blood sprinkled on the altar, and now his very blood for our sins. And he said, this is my blood given for you. And then he prayed, Father, we thank you for the sacrifice. We thank you for what it means to us, that you covered us right where we were, right where we are. May we not take the sacrifice lightly. Father, may we not curse the blood through our lives. But Father, instead, may this blood renew our lives. May it loosen our lips to sing your praises and to speak words of grace and mercy and forgiveness to one another. May it soften our hardened hearts and give them new life so that we can see with your eyes and feel with your spirit the needs of those around us. And then, Father, as it works its way and its amazing power through us to our feet and our hands to do the work. Father, may the strength of your blood go out to spread your gospel to all nations. Because you are worthy. Amen. Take each of you and drink. This morning we do continue with our journey toward the manger. I told Harlan I really like the sign out there. The first king-sized bed was a manger. Boy, what a beautiful example. We in our houses, in our affluence, would see a king-sized bed 
as a luxury item. And yet the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords condescended to borrow a stinky trough where cows' tongues have been, where sheep have climbed up in and messed in the hay. And yet the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords condescended, came down humbly enough to be born in that manger. How much pride should we have? Zero. We deserve nothing. He gave us everything. And so we should live that way. Our text for today is the first chapter of Matthew. We've been journeying, thinking about those who doubted. We looked at John, the announcer of the advent of the Messiah, in prison and in the difficulties, questioned, is this the one? Mary, concerned about how things would progress. And then now we will look. At Joseph. So Matthew chapter 1, beginning in verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will save the people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. When Joseph woke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded. He took his wife, but knew her not until she had given birth to a son, and he called his name Jesus. May God add blessing to the reading of his word. You may be seated. There have been many times through my life that I have been absolutely certain that the Lord had directed my steps, that he had called me, that he had led me into a task. A task of which I did not desire, that was even, wasn't even on my radar screen. And yet it was clear that he was calling for me to be a mighty warrior, like he said to Gideon. Let's think about that for just a moment because I want you to think about the calling in your life. What God is calling you to do that seems impossible. The mighty judge Gideon who would lead victories of Israel. The entirety of his story is one of doubt and fear. From the very beginning he is going about the task that he has to do. But he is fearful of the journey. And so he is found by an angel of the Lord beating wheat in a wine press. We will get the opportunity, those that are traveling to Israel, to see a wine press. It is cramped. Its whole purpose is to catch liquid. Wheat that has been beat out would absorb that liquid and become ruined. 
He was winnowing this wheat in a place that was inappropriate because he was afraid. When you winnow your wheat, it is to be exposed to air so that the shaft can fall away. But instead, he was working doubly hard to do the task that he needed to do. And on that day, the angel came and said, Mighty warrior. Now think about that just a moment in your lives. When God has called you to a task in your lives, did you feel like a mighty warrior? This is what the Lord declared to Gideon. And Gideon, like so many of us, declared to be a mighty warrior, yet hiding fulfilled what God had called him to do, but he did it by the darkness. Rather than boldly standing up and declaring what the angel had said, rather than being a prophet on a mountaintop declaring the day of the Lord, he went by night and quietly cut down the Asherah pole. And they were only discovered the next day and by rumor by someone that saw the torchlight in the night or something, it was exposed that he was the one that had done the task. The stories of Gideon continue, and throughout his time, that most familiar passage of the warriors that were set aside to defeat the nation's enemy were separated by drinking water in one of two fashions. We are not exactly sure those that will travel with us will get to go to the springs where Gideon had this trial. We'll overlook The Jezreel Valley, a wide plain where wars and battles were fought and as we read in Revelation, the final battle of Armageddon, which is another name for the Megiddo Valley, is believed to be fought. It is in this place that the overwhelming circumstances became visible to Gideon. It is on this story that our passage today hinges. I want you to think about the times when you were certain in your life that God was calling you, perhaps at your salvation. The Holy Spirit was prompting your heart, and yet maybe you were a young person in school, and though you may be around others that declared themselves Christians, the bullies, the in crowd, those that would be an opposition to the work of the Lord, caused you to doubt if this step was necessary and right and good at the moment. Or perhaps if you came to the Lord later in life, you'd become victorious in building your little kingdom, achieving the things that you wanted, or perhaps on the other extreme, you were so checked out by drugs and alcohol trying to drown the pain, but yet you heard the prompting. And the Lord said, as he did that day to Gideon, mighty warrior, prophet of God, rise up and be who I've made you to be. And you have doubted the question. Today, that is our Christmas story. A mighty warrior who gets very little attention in the Bible is approached to do an insurmountable task. Joseph, son of David, you will be the earthly father to the king of the universe. Be not afraid to take this woman as your wife and this child as your son. You would think, much like Mary and the debates that have arisen from there, the Magnificat raises up. We rage against those that would celebrate Mary, exalt her to a certain stature. That perhaps the Bible would treat Joseph in the same way. Because can you imagine? The Scriptures tell us he was a righteous man. Therefore, as a righteous man, a man of Israel, a follower of the law, and a descendant of the lineage of David, the right thing to do would be to divorce her. The right thing to do 
would be to declare that she was an adulterer and stone her. The right thing to do on this plane on earth was anything but bring that child into this world and claim it as his own. Matthew's account describes more than just a birth. In fact, the word that we read about Jesus' birth occurring this way can also be translated as origin. Think for me just a moment about how significant this passage that we have built an entire celebration in our year, an entire feast around how little is actually said about it and how little importance the birth of Christ is given. It is only Matthew and Luke that record it in any fashion. John, as I saw a funny Facebook meme this week, gives us some strange allegories about Jesus being the word that we have to interpret and come to understand. But the details of Jesus' birth are very few. And through theater and through acting and through movies and through extrapolation, we have added much that confuses the story. Little drummer boy is about to drive me nuts. Mary, did you know? Yes, she said yes to the angel, for goodness sakes. Of course she knew. All of the things that we have added to the story, but we want to look today at this origin of our Messiah. The account in the incarna- of the incarnation in Matthew stresses the fact of the virgin conception more than his birth. Matthew is more concerned that the fulfillment of Isaiah 7 has happened. The virgin shall conceive. This is the point. The church traditionally speaks of the virgin birth, but in fact, the Gospels stress Jesus' miraculous conception. God's dispatch of an angel is necessary because in Joseph's day, David's line is exhausted. It's nearly invisible. Joseph We extrapolate from the story as in Nazareth, but the Bible doesn't say that. They go to Nazareth, and we assume that's where they came from. Jesus' birth reignites hope, for he is from the line of David, but he's not from the flesh of David. The point of Joseph being the man betrothed to Mary is that this glimmer of the line that the Messiah will come from, this last vestige of the blood of King David is to be a sign that this is the Messiah. Ordinary flesh cannot save. David's heir, David's DNA will not be the king on the throne. Flesh cannot save us. God must, and he does. God renews the kingly line himself through his sinless son. But it must be so for now. Joseph is chosen by the Lord to raise this most amazing son What a task, fathers. For those of you that look around and wonder if your kids will ever become anything, can you imagine the magnitude of understanding that Joseph had in his mind? Son of David links the virgin conception to the Davidic line, to the genealogy, to Joseph's place in it. This is mentioned for Joseph's benefit that he should not fear to take Mary. What Joseph as a righteous man, an attender of synagogue, one that would be preparing himself to become a rabbi perhaps, 
and the preparation should not fear because her child is conceived not by man but by God's Spirit. Since she is faithful, there is no reason for divorce. Fear not. This is not adultery. Fear not, she has not been unfaithful. Fear not, she was not raped. Fear not, this is of the Spirit. Since she is faithful, divorce is precluded. And because Joseph will adopt him, Jesus will grow up with godly parents. What an amazing thing that God has orchestrated. So many, we will see, have fallen away in their faith because of the Roman oppression. So many of us have begun to look toward our government. So many of us watch the news in fear, and we forget the reality that God will save. It is not up to us. I've unfortunately been listening to a book lately about a particular movement within the Christian church. It is heartbreaking in some cases to hear words that I myself have begun to use that are wrong words because it is so insidious at how it is infiltrating our thought. But I take that as a lesson to guard my heart because it is a wellspring life. I take that as a reminder to not just simply believe, but to search, to return to the Scriptures, to get on my knees before the Holy Spirit, and to be reminded what true truth is. To dismiss emotion, to dismiss passion, To remind myself to return to the only one that can fill me and empower me to the work to be done. Joseph is not to be afraid. You and I are not to be afraid to declare ourselves followers of Jesus Christ. You and I are not to be afraid when the mock trials come, when the difficulties arise, when those at our workplaces use language and defame the glory of Christ. We are not to be afraid. We are not to condemn because Christ did not come to condemn the world. It is already condemned. And it is in this that we see the name that is to be given to this Messiah. The Lord often uses names to reveal His purposes. Names throughout the Scriptures, but especially the Old Testament, are tied to characteristics of what God is calling the person to. I've not preached that sermon here, but perhaps some of you saw the video recording of it. That the very story about Jesus' DNA lineage of earthly parents, David himself, commits adultery with a woman named Bathsheba. A woman whose name means daughter of the covenant. And David proceeds to break the vast majority of the covenant with her. He will then continue in his sin as he breaks the commandments with a woman whose name is daughter of those commandments. But God, full of grace and mercy, will send a man named Nathan or Nathan. Nathan means gift from God. You and I receive a gift over and over and over. Our sins, those that are not leading unto death, should lead us to separation. Our sins that should lead us unto death would require immediate dispatch of our lives. But yet God send us, sends us a nathan, a gift. 
that we too may receive the grace upon grace that we need so desperately. But here the angel comes and says, don't be afraid. Take this child as your own. The child that is conceived in your wife is not from adultery. The child is conceived from the Spirit. And he will be called Jesus. Thank God. He will be called Jesus. Which is a derivation, a reminder of God's saving grace. The Lord saves We need this salvation desperately because death is in our future. And not just physical, but eternal. He will be called Jesus. He will be the Messiah to come. He will be the King and sit on the throne. These things are true. But all of this has to happen because there is another name. He will be called Jesus and we will rejoice with great gladness. But he will be Emmanuel. Folks, we sing a beautiful song at Christmas time. It was sung with beauty today. Emmanuel, Emmanuel, God with us. And we sing that with this joy in our hearts. Yes, Lord, come. We want God with us. But the story that is being referred to by Matthew here that I read moments ago as our Old Testament reading from Isaiah chapter 7 is not a good story. A tyrannical king who refuses to accept man's admonition and then in the face of a prophet says I will not take God's admonition. And this will be a sign of your judgment. A virgin will conceive. And he will be Emmanuel. God come down. God who meets out his wrath on the disobedient will come and dwell personally and take care of you. If you do not praise him in that moment, then the curse will come. But praise God. Praise God. Jesus came in the fashion fulfilled in Isaiah chapter 7. Not to be God with us. Yes, He was God incarnate. Yes, He came and was all that God is and all that man is. And it is with great mercy and grace that He did not come to destroy us, but to give us a second chance. To restore the Davidic line, the line of David that rather than having adulterous relationships with Bathsheba, the daughter of the covenant, should have outhold the righteousness and the standard. A line of kingship that had to repent And in Psalm 51, we read about that repentance, that it is a broken and a contrite heart, not sacrifices that the Lord deserves. So we will see the answer to David's call, the answer to David's line. In this Messiah, in this Jesus, in this Savior, we will see mercy in a manger. Jesus will bring the humble. He will announce the birth of His Son's coming to the most humble that there are. And they will get the first chance to see. He will finally bring in fulfillment to some astronomers, observations of their studies, a fulfillment That the prophecies are true because they have humbled themselves to seek Him. And they will arrive and God will be gracious. But yet, those 
that existed at that time and you and I today that needed this Jesus, that needed the meekness, power under control. Meekness means power under control, like a horse that is bridled. The strength of the horse remains. The strength of the horse is there to do the work that it is called to do, but is under control and direction by the one that controls the reins. Jesus came to be meek. He didn't come to be a sissy. Jesus came power under control. We deserved Emmanuel. Emmanuel will come. God with us on that day will separate the wheat from the tares. God on that day will separate the lambs from the goats. And they will be cast into a fire that never quenches. But on this day, God comes to us as Savior, meek and humble. This calls forth a human response. The Lord initiates our redemption by creating life in the womb of a virgin. The Father spares Jesus the corruption of sin and prepares him to become the one who will save his people from their sins in verse 21. The name Jesus, Yahweh saves, teaches that we cannot save ourselves. Ordinary flesh cannot save. We cannot do this in our own power. God saves and God alone. And he inaugurates that salvation at the birth of Jesus. Jesus' very name suggests that sin is humanity's core problem. Calamity comes from accidents, disease, natural disaster, and more. These things are the things of life. They are not sin. They are trials. They are temptations. They are struggles and conflicts that we will have to deal with. But the core problem is sin, the ultimate source of all our trouble. For those that have been with me on Sunday nights in our last study, we looked at that very reality. The whole purpose of the Ten Commandments is to remind us that it is our pride that separates us from God. It is our desires for ourselves and our comfort and our security and our safety and our wants that removes us from the holy presence of our God. But he offers deliverance. If any would reject him, he brings woe. God offered Ahaz a sign of Emmanuel, God with us. But Jesus is God with us. Ahaz represents all who are indifferent to God's presence. Some may be pleased that Christians find comfort in such myths. But Emmanuel is not a religious experience. Emmanuel is truth. Emmanuel is truth. Whether you receive him or not. The church focuses on Emmanuel when it remembers Jesus' life in the flesh. Jesus is still God with us by the Spirit's indwelling in us. God is with us. If we believe He is with us to bless and to save, if not, God is still with us to call us to repentance. Tenderly calling but failing that, and this is what terrifies me for everyone. Failing that call to repentance and your response. He is God with us to judge. 
God is always with us. One can ignore, deny, even curse God, but he never disappears. Nevertheless, with Jesus' birth, God draws near to humanity in a new way. Matthew accents that this is essential in the essential moments at the beginning, the midpoint, and the end of his gospel. Think with me this reality. Matthew calls us back to the prophecy in Isaiah 7 that Jesus is God with us. He mentions this at the beginning, and the mercy and the grace is that He is Jesus, our Savior. In the midpoint, as we will see, He begins to show them that the curse is real, and at the end, He reminds His disciples that He will never leave and forsake the faithful. In the incarnation, in the birth, in the appearance, we learn that Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us, but to save. At the midpoint, Jesus is with us in church discipline, which preserves the church's purity and unity. Over and over in the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus will remind us that the axe is at the root. He will remind us that the pruning shears will come. He will remind us that the fires will purge. Brothers and sisters, in this very church, there may be some who are in danger of falling away because of where we are in our selfish intentions and pride. But before Jesus ascends, we have the most beautiful promise. Jesus commands the apostles to disciple the nations. All that he spent his 33 years doing, all that he put an exclamation point on the end of at his resurrection, it is now the task of the disciples to take to all nations. And by virtue of what we have received, it becomes our task to take the gospel to all nations. But Jesus declares in that reminder, in that calling like of Gideon, he says to each of us, mighty warrior, I have a task for you and we don't feel like mighty warriors. But Jesus says to the 11 that have gathered, I will be with you always. All authority on heaven and earth has been given to me. I possess that. I go away for a time. I leave you the spirit to comfort you, to empower you to do even greater things. So this is one of the warnings. The greater things is, brothers and sisters, you and I will not do miracles that exceed Jesus' miracles. Oh no, we could take it that way. You and I will not be given a life of pleasure and ease unlike Jesus, our Lord and Savior. No. In fact, he says it may be harder. When Jesus says greater works you will do than I, he was but one. You and I as the church are many. You and I are multipliers of the message. You and I are givers of the gospel. You and I are examples of the glory. And so it is in that that we must go knowing all authority was given to him on that day of his birth on that reminder of his earthly father you and I received that precious gift if we will but receive it we can see exemplary faith in Joseph's faithfulness yes Mary and Joseph did something that was out of the ordinary They did something that was very hard, and yet they were faithful. He controls the natural impulse to protect his honor. Are we worried about our honor? Are we worried about what people think about us more than what they think about this Messiah. He also takes his place, Joseph does, in the history of the redemption as Jesus' human father. And it is because of this faith that he knows the Lord as Emmanuel, 
and as Savior. By faith, all who accept Matthew's good news know Jesus in the same way. Do we not? So brothers and sisters, this day, as we prepare for all the activities, I hope to see you at Karen and Eric's house to celebrate together as a community. I hope to see you in the highways and the byways in the next coming days, maybe not standing out as much as we normally do because it's going to be cold. But I hope to see you and rejoice in hearing not the kind of cookies you baked, not the presents that you received, not the presents that you gave, but the joy and the victory of the one gift that we all desperately needed. And the calling and the working in your life. This Christmas season, take an opportunity to bore your grandchildren to death with your salvation story. Take an opportunity between all the stories that you tell over and over again to tell the most amazing story. That though we deserved Emmanuel to divide the wicked from the righteous, and he did come. We got instead a gift, a nathan of Jesus. And we can be saved. This day, will you respond as a reminder of the burden of the great gift that you have given, been given? A burden that is light, as Jesus told us, because of all the trials and troubles that you would seek your own way in this world if you would but look to Him. The heaviness would be lifted. And he would forgive you because he is faithful and just. Today I would also encourage you to look again at where you are in your celebration. Have you made gentle Jesus, meek and mild, the little baby Jesus in the bed, the primary focus of your faith? Or like the gospel writers, have you focused on the miraculous appearing of Emmanuel to save you. Refresh that. Renew that this season. And then if there are any in the sound of my voice. In this room. Those that I would encounter. That thus far can only see. A vengeful God that you care nothing about. That you would turn down. That you can only see the hurt perhaps that you received from a church or from a so-called Christian. And so you have turned your back on this gift of Jesus. Come today with a broken and a contrite heart knowing that God cares enough to save you if you will but accept it. Miss Sherry, come and lead us in a time of remembrance and repentance, because the Lord prompts you through His Spirit. Move.
Brother Chris has come forward this morning asking the elders to assemble to pray in proxy for uh, uh, Barry Waters, who is fighting leukemia. Uh, we do want to pray for his healing. I will add an unspoken prayer request at this moment of another brother that is facing a possible diagnosis of cancer. And so we want to pray for God's comfort and mercy and healing in his life. But we bring further forward our brother here. He has requested prayer from the elders. And so if they would lay hands on him in response to Brother Waters. And if Jim Starks, if you would lead our collective prayer. To depart, um, I will be, as a reminder, I've got a meeting with those that are going to Israel, so I won't be at the back. Stoney, you can greet them all, though, all right, brother? Um, and uh, But I hope to have the opportunity to, to shake your hand and love on you as the day progresses. Uh, we will have service tonight pending no snow, and uh, so let's gather back together as we study God's Word. Brother Butch, would you close us out in prayer? We will. Let's pray. A kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for such a blessed day. We thank you for this season, Lord. We thank you for your Son. That you sent him here to save us from our sins. And Lord, when we leave here today, let us remember the real reason for the season. And let us come back at the next point in time. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen.